Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here this morning. We're going to morning. be in Luke chapter 24 in our Bibles, so please turn to Luke chapter 24. And um, our message today is the new faith in Christ, the new faith in Christ. And I'm looking at Jesus and his interaction with the disciples after his resurrection until his ascension. So uh, we celebrated Easter two weeks ago, and during this period of time, there's 40 days, where Jesus, before he ascended, he was with his disciples teaching them. And so we want to look at some of the things that Jesus taught them in this period. And, and this is why I call it the new faith in Christ, because this is new for the disciples. Jesus has been with them, and now they are uh, moving on to this new uh, life that comes from their relationship to Jesus Christ. Please pray with me as we get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning, and I thank you for each and every person that's here today. I know, Lord, that so many have obstacles to overcome and are carrying burdens upon their heart, and yet you have brought us together in this place. I pray, O oh Lord, for your grace upon, uh, upon each one of us and the burdens that we might be carrying. I pray, O oh Lord God, that you would pour out your comfort and your peace upon us. I pray, O oh Lord, that we would trust in you no matter what, that we would believe in you and that we would uh, consider you and that we would walk in your ways. I pray, O oh Lord, that you would open our understanding as we consider your word and this relationship that we have with you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm in Luke chapter 24 this morning, and like I said, this is uh, going to talk about the resurrection, and it's going to talk, talk about some of the time that Jesus was with his disciples after the resurrection. So beginning in verse 1, it says, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared, but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words, then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen clothes lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all those things which had happened. So it was, while they conversed and reasoned, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained, that they did not know him. And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then the, then the one, whose name was Cleophas, answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see then he said to, one, to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. 
Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road, and while he opened the scriptures to us? So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem, and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, Have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish, of a broiled fish, and some honeycomb. And he took it and ate in their presence. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all, the, all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, and the prophets, and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understandings, that they might comprehend the scripture. Now this is the account of Jesus right up until his ascension. This is the time after the resurrection. I mean, we read part of the resurrection uh, account here at the beginning of Luke chapter 24. But after Christ rose again from the dead, he hung around for 40 days. Now that's quite a bit of time, 40 days. It's, it's over a month. And the question is, why did Jesus hang around after he rose again from the dead for these 40 days? In, now, for what purpose, what was his intent in staying around for 40 days after the resurrection before his ascension? And by the way, we're going to keep the cross up here uh, with uh, the white cloth, uh, remembering the resurrection of Christ for 40 days, and then we will have one Sunday in which we come together, and we will talk about the ascension on that day, and uh, the cross will be down on that Sunday. So anyway... In Luke chapter 24, we have basically three accounts, including the resurrection, of Jesus' interaction with his disciples after his resurrection. And there are certain things that kind of stand out in each of these accounts, similar things, and that is what we want to focus on beginning this morning. So as we look at this chapter, there are several exhortations that come to us, exhortations that arise out of the passage here. And the first one is this, don't doubt, don't doubt. Now, when we're talking about these episodes, the first one, of course, is the empty tomb. The women are coming to the tomb, they, uh, they have some you know, ointment that they want to anoint Jesus with, and they are concerned about how they're going to roll the stone away so that they can get in there and anoint Jesus with this ointment. And so they don't know how it's going to happen, but of course when they get there, they see the, that the stone has been rolled away, and they see this angel who speaks to them. And at the empty tomb, the angel reminds them of the words of Jesus. And we find those in verse 7. This, these are the words that the angel reminds the women of. It says, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and the third day rise again. This is what Jesus had told his disciples before his death. He told them that he would be delivered into the hands of sinful men, that he would be crucified, and the third day rise again. He told them this. Now, granted, the resurrection, wrapping your head around the resurrection, that is probably the most difficult thing to come to grips with. And I can kind of sympathize or empathize, or whatever the right word is there, with the, the, the disciples as they are trying to grasp the reality of the resurrection. He told them it was going to happen. And even though he told them, they still didn't get it. And so we see in these accounts, part of the exhortation is that they should not 
doubt. In verse 11, it says, their words, this is the women, they come back to the disciples, and here are the disciples, they hear what the women say, and it says this about them, their words seemed to them like idle tales. I hope they didn't say that out loud to the women. <laughs> Their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. Now, this is, this is uh, the same thing with disciples. They heard the words of Jesus, and now they have an eye, some eyewitness accounts, these women, that the tomb is empty, and the women are telling the disciples what happened, and they still did not believe them. Should they have believed them? Well, yes, Jesus himself told them plainly. It wasn't a parable. It wasn't a story. It wasn't a hidden meaning. He told them plainly he was going to be delivered. He was going to be crucified. And he would rise again the third day. He told them just, just as plain as that. And they still did not believe. The next account is this, the road to Emmaus. And you have these two disciples and they're walking back. And these two disciples, they're not part of the twelve. One of them is named Cleophas. We don't know who the other one uh, was. It could have been, uh, some people actually believe that this is a husband and wife. They're walking back uh, from Jerusalem. They're walking to Emmaus. It's about seven miles distance. And while they're walking, this other guy joins them. And they don't know that it's Jesus. It's Jesus. But they don't know their eyes are kind of, uh, they, they don't recognize, their eyes are, they're hid, he's hid from their sight, or, or maybe, as uh, some people think, and that the resurrection body of Jesus was different enough where they just did not put two and two together. At any rate, they did not recognize that Jesus was walking with him. And so they recount to Jesus the events of what had happened, and uh, the good part of uh, chapter 24 is Jesus dealing with these two disciples. And so they tell what had happened, and they're kind of perplexed. How could you be in Jerusalem and not know what happened to Jesus and Nazareth? Uh, how could this be? So they're a little uh, confused by that, and, um, and they're having trouble believing um, what is happening. They even say in this part, we had hoped that he was the one sent from God. That, that's what they said. We had hoped. But of course, that hope, in their minds, has been dashed to pieces because he was crucified. We had hoped that he was the one, but he's dead. So it must not have been him. It says in verses 19 through 21, and this shows that they had some information. It says, they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people. You see, this is what they thought about Jesus. He was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. And that indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. So they have some information. They have some insight into and understanding into who Jesus is. But they are, they're, just not, they're just not putting it all together. And they're having difficulty uh, believing. And it says in verse 25 that they had um, the, the, well, they understood the prophets there. So this is what Jesus says. This is kind of their, his rebuke to them in verse 25, he says, Then he said to them, O foolish ones, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Now you see what he's saying? He's saying, you have the prophets, and you know what they have spoken, but, O foolish ones, you are slow in heart to believe it all. So, here it is, they have some information, they, they know enough, and yet they are unbelieving. And then it says in verse 27, Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now there is a challenge for any Bible scholar to go through the entire Old Testament and preach Jesus. That's what Jesus did. He went through the Old Testament and he told them and he pointed out to them how it told about himself. So after all of this, and despite all of this, they are sad. Verse 17. Now why would they be sad? He says in verse 17, uh, what, what are you guys talking about um, that you have with one another? What is this conversation you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Why are you sad? 
Now, would you be sad if you knew that Jesus rose again from the dead? Well, no, you wouldn't be sad. I mean, that's what was making them sad, the fact that he was dead. But they didn't believe. They were doubting of the resurrection, even though they had some information. Oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? So this is Jesus' interaction with these disciples. And so Jesus here is talking about his resurrection. There he is after his resurrection. The resurrection, like I said, is the greatest miracle. It is probably, I mean, like I said before, I can understand them having trouble believing that he had risen from the dead. But he had told them, and, uh, uh, and yet they needed help in order to believe. They have some information, and yet they don't believe. Their faith was limited. And so we have to uh, come to an understanding here because I, I uh, you know, myself included, there are things in our lives that are difficult to understand with, our, with respect to our relationship to God. I mean, do you have any questions about God and about who He is and about some, some things about Him? And do you have any questions about why are things happening in your life and do you have trouble uh, believing in Him? Do you know some people... Uh, experience bad things in their life, and that just causes them to doubt God. Well, I tried God, and it just didn't work for me. Have you ever heard somebody say something like that? Or maybe you kind of uh, wrestled with that feeling yourself. You know, you've heard it before, you've heard the word, you have some information, and yet the thing that's happening in your life is such that it is causing you to doubt in Him. Because it just seems too big. It seems too hard to wrap your mind around. And you don't understand. And you have all of these questions. Jesus rebukes his disciples for doubting. Why are you doubting? Oh foolish one. And, and that's pretty telling. Because he is basically telling these two disciples. And all of his disciples. He's telling them, you should be believing. You should be believing, but you're not. You are slow of heart. And that brings us to our second point this morning. First of all, don't doubt. But second of all, you have enough not to doubt. You have enough not to doubt. And, and really, this is where the doubting becomes problematic. They're not doubting because they don't understand. They're not doubting because they don't, they don't uh, see. I mean, they don't see everything, and they don't understand everything. But what they do have is enough where they should believe. And this is where it kind of hits home for us, because we have so much more than the disciples did. You realize that? We, today, have so much more than the disciples did. We can, we can uh, open up our Bibles and we can read about it. We know how it started. We know how it's going to end, right? We have a whole lot here in this word that has been given to us. We have the testimony of the scriptures. We have the testimony of others who have believed through the history of the church up until our day. We have their testimony of their faith. Have you, has anyone ever read Fox's book of the martyrs? Or have you ever heard of some stories of Christians who were, um, you know, martyred in the past or of people who lived in the past uh, and were encouraged by their stories? Have you ever read any accounts of other believers in the past? Well, I hope that you have. Um, you know, there's some pretty amazing stories. There's uh, Irenaeus in, uh, in the early, he was one of the church fathers. And he served the Lord for 80 or so years. And then they had arrested him and they were going to burn him at the stake. And the person who had arrested him, the Romans there, they had said to him, if you recount to Jesus, we'll let you live out the rest of your days in peace. And he, he replies, for these 80 years, Jesus has been faithful to me. Why am I going to turn from him now? In the, at the last moment. And so he doesn't recant, and they burn him at the stake. And of course, they, uh, you know, there's uh, 
his, his faith is exemplified in that. But, you know, we can come to more modern times and we can uh, look at others who have had faith. Maybe there's some testimony that you've heard of somebody. You know, there's some people out there, some pretty remarkable testimonies of what God has done in their lives. I mean, some of you have some pretty amazing testimonies. Uh, all of our testimonies should be amazing that I was a sinner and yet he saved me and forgave me of my sins. That's amazing in itself. But, you know, people have testimonies and they, have, they share their great faith and, and uh, their trust in the Lord. And we are encouraged by that. And that becomes another testimony to us. If, if God did it for them, then I can, I can believe in him too and he will do it for me and he will help me as well. And so I have the scriptures. I know what it's like. I have the testimony of others who have believed in him and have persevered in their faith. We have, like I said, the Word of God and, and all of the explanation that it gives us for everything. And yet, even though we have so much and we have all of these promises, we doubt and we struggle and we get distracted and we allow circumstances to dictate our faith for us. You know what that means? We allow what is happening to us to tell us about how faith, our faith should be. And so rather than our faith carrying us through the day, it is usually the circumstances of our life that carry us through the day. And that shouldn't be. We should take what we have. We have enough. The disciples, they had enough. They had the testimony. They should have believed. And yet they were doubting. And, and here we are. We are in the same situation. We have all that we have, we have enough to believe in Him and to, be, to, to be strong in faith. And yet we find ourselves faltering. And we don't want to be like that. We want to uh, be faithful to the end. We want to trust in the Lord even though we don't understand or see everything fully. And so the, the Scripture encourages us in several ways. So we're going to turn to some Bible verses. I hope you have your Bibles with you. The first one is 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles, and uh, if you don't, it's okay for you to get up. And uh, If you're going to get up, I'd rather you get up and go get the Bible than get up and go to the bathroom. <laughs> so if you want to get up now, that's okay. We have some Bibles in the back there. But 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. Now here's a testimony to this church in Thessalonica. It says in verse 1, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 1, Paul, and Silve Paul Silvanus, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound, we are bound, you see what Paul says there? We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God, for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you also suffer. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you, and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. That's a pretty powerful passage there. But notice how he starts... Out. He starts out, and he, remembering the Thessalonians, he basically says, I thank God because your faith grows exceedingly, and your love abounds towards one another. Now, isn't that a great testimony to have? That is the kind of testimony, that is the kind of testimony that I want for us here in this church. That is the kind of testimony I want us to have. When people think about us, I don't want us, I don't want them to think that we have think, when they think of us that we they think about how many of us there are. Oh, they have you know ten thousand people 
over there at Baker Heights Baptist Church. <laughs> that, that's kind of where it goes these days, right? Oh, you know, you know that church, that big church over there, they are a big church. Or that church over there, they are a big church. They have a thousand people on Easter Sunday. That, that's kind of how people think of uh, other churches. But when they think of our church, I don't want them to think about how many of us there are. I want them to think about how we are a church where our faith is growing exceedingly. And I want them to think of our church as being a church of love that abounds to one another. That's what I want them to think when they think about us. Now, here's what it means. We say amen to that. Woo, amen, right? <laughs> but you know, if they're going to think of us like that, that means each one of us here this morning must be the Christian that is growing in our faith exceedingly. We must be the Christian whose love abounds to others. And so each one of us has to act like that or to be like that. And here's the great thing. We have enough for that to happen. There, there, is, there is nothing we have to wait for for this to take place. We don't have to wait for it to happen. We have enough. It has been given to us. We have more than enough. We have the Word of God. We have the presence of the Spirit of God within our hearts. We have His presence here in our midst this morning. Amen? Do you believe that? We have a relationship with Him. Praise the Lord. And so let our faith grow exceedingly. In Sunday school this morning, we were reading the passage in Hebrews chapter 10. Um, where we're supposed to go to church. You know that passage? Well, we read the first before that. And it talks about what we're supposed to do when we get together. It says that we're supposed to love to stir up one another to love and good works. To stir up one another to love and good works. We were talking about going through the motions, right? And it's so easy just to kind of fall into a pattern and you just go through the motions. I mean, we've all uh, been there and done that. And, and, uh, and there's probably even some of us here this morning that are going through the motions for one reason or another. Maybe you're just tired. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be some nefarious evil plot. It just might be simple. I'm just that. Uh, I'm just going through the motions because I'm just, I'm just tired, right? You know what I mean? All right, then don't feel good today. I'm just going through the motions. So, anyway, that's not a good testimony for us to have. I know we get tired and we get sick, sick and tired, and you know all of the above. <laughs> I know that's how we get, and it's easy to go through the motions. But part of coming together is so that we can stir each other up. So that we can help each other along. So that we can go along together. And so we come together and we stir one another up. To get us up out of the rut. Or if in Ben's case off of the ceiling. Ben, ben Bray, you know Ben, tall Ben. He, he's like a hot air balloon that goes to the top of the ceiling and stops there. <laughs> it was pretty funny. You had to be there in sunny school class. But, uh, <laughs> so uh, if you've fallen down into the rut, we'll help you out. And if you're... If, you, if you're a balloon at the ceiling there, we'll grab the string and we'll pull you down. And whatever we have to do to get us going, right? Yeah. To stir each other up. So that we can be the church or the believers whose faith grows exceedingly. It doesn't say faith that grows a little bit. It says great faith that grows exceedingly. I don't even know what that would look like. If I grew in my faith today like this much, and then tomorrow, by that much, by the end of the week, I'll be moving all the mountains around here, <laughs> the, doing the excavation myself, <laughs> rather than paying a hundred thousand dollars to these people to come in with their equipment and move the dirt for me. So anyway, that's what it says. That's important. We want to be strong in faith. Amen. 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 It's our faith that's going to carry us through the hard circumstances of our life. We need that faith. But we also need love that abounds to each one. Love and compassion. Hey, we are nothing without love. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians 12, I think. It says, though you have faith to move mountains, and though you, um, though, though you have, uh, I don't know, prophecy, and 
all of those things. Oh, it must be ch yeah, chapter 13. It says, Though I speak with tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. <laughs> I, I love that verse because uh, if, if, if you start talking and you're not talking with love, it's like you're just a clanging cymbal. I was, in, I was in Zambia. I might have shared the story with you or not. I don't know. I was teaching on this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So I had, the, I had conscripted one of the Zambians. And he, he got a big pot and a, a wooden spoon. And I, and I told him, when I get to this certain point, every time I open my mouth to say something, start whacking the pot. So I had opened my mouth and I start, you know, saying something about the passage and he's he whacks, he whacks the pot and stops. And I paused, and then I, and then I opened my mouth to speak again, and I said two words, and he started whacking. The, well, by you know the third time, everybody's looking around, you know, what's going on here? And uh, so I kind of used that as the illustration um, that you know love is so important, and and look, our words are important, and if we open our words. Our, open our mouth and our words are not carried by love, we're going to be like this annoying, it's like our alarm clock that goes off at 6 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> that's what we're going to, that's how we're going to come across. And we don't want to do that, right? We want to come across with the love and compassion. We want our love to abound always towards one another. And so this is part of our, our growth here. This is part of the expression of our faith. This is what Jesus is hoping that the disciples, that they will take his word and they will believe in him. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians 16. And uh, Paul, the, the, the epistles of Paul usually end up with some series of exhortations, some practical exhortations. And so they usually, they're usually like rapid fire, you know, short phrase, bang, 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 bang. And so we see some of that in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And the wording here is, is kind of interesting. Look at what it says in verse 13. It says, watch, stand fast in the faith. You, you, know, uh, you know what the word fast means here? It's akin to fastener. You know how you, you fasten one thing to another? We sing that song, He will hold me fast. Right? He will hold me fast. It's talking about He will hold me securely. And, and, uh, and so here it says, Stand securely. Stand firmly in the faith. Look at the next one. Be brave. Be brave. I know you're facing something hard, but don't be a coward about it. I know it's hard. I know it hurts. Be brave. That, that's not an exhortation we see too often. Be strong. That's the next one. Be strong. Be brave. Be strong. Watch. Stand firmly in the faith. Let all that you do be done. There it is again, right? Let all that you do be done with what? Love. I mean, that's what he said just a couple chapters before. So, so here's the exhortation for us. We are not there with the disciples to grasp believing in the resurrected Lord. We are way down the road grasping with the resurrected Lord to believe and to walk in his ways, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's look at that passage. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. <clears throat> and here's a passage that you want to highlight if you're having a hard time. And notice the exhortation in it. So 2 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse... Seven. Unless I should be exalted above measure, Paul shared, by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, 
a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Let me just stop there. A lot of discussion has revolved around what this thorn in the flesh was really all about. And uh, it really doesn't matter, except for two things, that it was something he did not want anymore, right? So whether it was a physical infirmity or a spiritual attack, it doesn't matter. It was something that he did not want in his life. And it was something that was there to keep him humble, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, verse 8, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, if we don't take anything else from this passage, the infirmities and the reproaches and the distresses and the needs and the persecutions that Paul is experiencing is meant for me being strong in Christ. Now that is backwards from how we usually view our infirmities. We have an infirmity come upon us and we feel weak and beat up and laying flat on the ground. But that is not the end game of this. Because when I am weak, then I am strong. And so going back to 1 Corinthians 16, 13, watch, stand fast, fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. No matter what, he wants us and he helps us, which is actually the next point which we're not going to do this morning. Unless you feel like, anybody feel like being here another 45 minutes? <laughs> okay, All right, everybody else is dismissed. We'll continue on another 45 minutes. But uh, anyway, the next part is that uh, we're not supposed to doubt, right? And we have enough. We have enough not to doubt. And next time we're going to see that he helps us use what we have so that we don't doubt. That's amazing. Or we're not in this by ourselves. He's there to help us. And we see throughout the passage in Luke, after his resurrection, we see how over and over he gives help to his disciples to believe in their unbelief. And so here he is for us. He doesn't want us to doubt. He has given us enough, and he helps us use it. So it's like the, um, Andrew and I, we built you know, the cornhole game. So uh, we went out, we got some directions offline, and, uh, and we built these, you know, cornholes. So we have them at our home, and we pull them out every once in a while, and we play our cornhole game. But it's, it's like, I give Andrew all of the tools, and all of the, the materials that he needs to build the cornhole, and I just say, go to it. You got everything you need, now go do it. Um... And if he has no experience, he's not going to be able to do that, right? He needs some help with that. So that's how it is the Lord with us. He gives us all the materials, he gives us all the tools, but he doesn't just say, go do it, without coming with us and helping us, to showing us how to use the tools and how to put the materials together, and how to cut the wood, and how to do all of this. He helps us, so that will be our next point next week. In the meantime, let us take the exhortations and the encouragements from these verses Help us to understand, even now, I have all that I need by God's grace. I have everything that I need. It, it might seem overwhelming, but God doesn't leave us like that. He gives us everything that we need. And so let us believe. Let us believe. Let us, let us grow in our faith exceedingly. Amen? Amen. And let our love abound always to one another. Amen? Amen. Let that be what characterizes us. And let that be what others think of us when they, uh, what others think when they think of us. Yeah.